check one two check one two north Rockland central school district board of education meeting
board docs. The board docs has the agenda to this meeting as, as well as minutes to prior uh, meetings. If anyone wishes to make public comment, that'll be uh, item nine of our agenda. Simply sign in here at the front and we will uh, listen to your questions and comments at that time. Without further ado, let us rise for the pledge. At this time, I ask that all please rise as representatives from the North Rockland High School ROTC present the colors. Please remain standing as Cadet Ariel Sanchez recites our pledge. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce members of the fourth grade Willow Grove Band under the direction of Casey Leesburg. Best of our students. 
We congratulate the North Rockland NROTC for their exceptional performance at the Area 4 Drill Academic, Physical Fitness, and STEM Championship. There was fierce competition drawing the best of 66 schools in Area 4, the Northeastern United States, and Europe. But North Rockland came out on top. Visit our North Rockland Central School District website for 22-23 Universal Pre-K Program and the Full Day Pre-K Program applications that will be accepted from January 31st through March 31st. There's still time to vote for Jen Lavier, the number of North Rockland Strong, Let's make her a finalist in the National Hockey League Most Valuable Teacher MVT program and one step closer to winning 30,000 plus worth of grants for our district. Jen is an incredible educator who does so much for her students. It's no surprise that she is one of only 20 nominees across North America chosen January's Future Goals MVT. We are so proud of her. Visit our website, our, uh, excuse me, our Facebook and social media pages to vote for her. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Manini. Anybody else? Can't see everybody, but no? Okay. Just like to remind everyone, uh, the superintendent, uh, Dr. Filicello, sends out a weekly update to the school community, but that's available to everybody on our district website. If you go on there on the superintendent's message, uh, there's a weekly update posted as long as, as well as all the latest information. No one else with board member report? Okay. Let's move on. Item six of our agenda, presentations, recognition, superintendent's reports, Dr. Filicello. Yes, it's, it's become somewhat of a tradition here in North Rockland over the past couple of years to recognize some of the folks that are behind the scenes that make us a special place, being North Rockland, the special place that it is. Some of those, those people aren't always in the spotlight. Mr. Zolo uh, found a company that's two North Rockland grads that puts together these videos for us that highlight some of these folks that don't get the recognition often that they deserve. And I'm pleased to, uh, to introduce Mike DeGroat, the video from Mike DeGroat's custodian at Willow Grove, our head custodian over there. And, I had the pleasure of working with Mike when I first came to the district at, at, when he was at Farley and I was at Farley, and he's a, a great asset to the district for sure. So without further ado, if we can roll the video for Mr.
Daniels, I've worked with Mike, know that he is a hard worker and he is awful consistent. And we're very proud to have him in North Rockland. Some other folks that we're really proud of, and another department that we're very proud of, is our food service department. And I know Mr. Pasalipo and Ms. Finucan have worked very hard to make improvements, to make sure that all of our families are fed during the pandemic, and even as we return. So I'd like to ask them to come down for a moment, please. And recently they were awarded, and the whole department was awarded, with a School Nutrition Recognition Award by No Hungry Kid, No Kid Hungry in, uh, in the state. And uh, it just highlights all the work that they've done for our community, for our kids, for our families. And uh, I want to present this to you guys. And thank you for all you do. And then just a small token. Thank you guys for all you do, right? Thank you. I remember when, one time I was talking to Ray and said, Ray, we gotta get you know some of this these the salad bar going and some different choices for the kids. And he's like, ah. And then I so saw Ian, his son, I said, Ian, you gotta get after your dad. And as soon as he went after his dad, he's like, We're getting that salad bar, we're getting going. So not only is, is Ray a great food service person, he's a great dad too. So uh, thank you guys for all you do. Another recognition I'd like to ask English teacher Megan Dufek Ferry to come on down and a special award for her as well. <laughs> Megan was re recently recognized for an award for having a modern classroom and a distinguished educator. And uh, she's part of a wonderful English department we have at the high school. We have a little token of recognition for you. And Megan, do you want to tell us a little bit about the award and how you got it? Or I don't want to put you on the spot. As... Yeah. All right, I took a summer training through the Modern Classrooms Project. Um, over the summer, looking to utilize technology tools to support our kids in hybrid situations and in-person situations. Um, after the training, I had the opportunity to submit some of my work back to them for them to uh, spread to other teachers taking the trainings um, and in return this way. Thank you, Megan. Great job. So you see a lot of our, our student athletes in the crowd tonight and, and a very successful fall sports season and we're, we're heading into our pretty deep into our winter season have had a lot of continued success but we do want to recognize some of our fall athletes for how they've distinguished themselves not only as in their team play but also as individuals so what i'll do is i will call our different teams down i know some of our athletes are joining us virtually and, and viewing from home and, and some are doing homework or whatever it may be but we have many of you here tonight so i'd like to start with let's ask anyone from our we have our girls volleyball team. So any members of our girls volleyball team and Coach Eckert, come on down. I know these guys brought us a lot of joy this year as we followed them and, and uh, all the way to the section championship and into the state tournament. And um, I tell you, you guys were, were a lot of fun to watch this year and I uh, look forward to continued success in future years and coach of the year Eckert uh, congratulations on your awards we're going to turn it over to you Mr. Eckert to say a few words and to um, say what a great job you never lost the words come on <laughs> Jessica we have an assistant coach so she's sitting here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we had a great year worked hard from the beginning. We picked up what we left off the previous year in the pandemic. We had a short season. We actually won the regional. That was a little taste of winning the sections, and then we went on and we won the sections. We hadn't been there in about, what, 10, 16 years? 15, to be exact. We hadn't been there, so we're, we're glad that we won. Uh, it was all close to them. I have a couple of them that are coming back. I'm losing a few seniors that I'll miss and hopefully they'll follow us, and you guys will be able to follow us also. We have an exciting team. We are actually on the move. 
I'm going to read some of the individual awards and then I'll have you give certificates to the students that were here. So we have Neve, how do I pronounce it? I don't want to mispronounce it. Fossil. Say so Neve is playing basketball and I'm at a game today at 4.30, but she was second team all state, all section, all conference, all league, league player of the year, and all county first team. So a round of applause. For you. Kayla, Nicholas, Kayla here. Glasses, I can't see far. I can't see. Kayla, third team all state, all section, all conference, all league, all county first team. She was our, our what do they call it? The spiker, right? What do you call that? I, I, outside heading, the spiker, I call it. She's one that always got the, all the kills first, but great job, Kayla. Gabriella Cologne, all section, all conference, all county honorable mention, all league. Big round of applause for Gabriella. Imaris Guzman, all conference, all league, all county honorable mention. Big round of applause. Angelise Picado, all league, all county second team. Good job, Angelise. Jalen Barbosa, All County Honorable Mention. And Olivia Abrams, All County Honorable Mention. Congratulations. See you, coach, because I'm going to pass the mic off to you. 
Great job, and you guys came on strong at the end too. Got a few wins, right? Moving in the right direction. Yeah. So, good job. Um, so this year was a very special year for us, um, especially because when I started my field hockey um, coaching career three years ago, these were the last group of seniors that I'll be um, that I started that that experience with. So they definitely have a special place in my heart as well as uh, the team this year. I couldn't have asked for a better group of girls um, to the work ethic, uh, very down to the mindset, the perseverance. So thank you.
helped retain our league title once again for Suffern at a tiebreaker, and they helped to win their second of three uh, years in a row with their uh, county championship the last two years. Standing tradition in, in girls cross country, of course, and you guys kept it going this year. I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself. Jane Casmina. Savannah Pesman. And I'm gonna read all the members of the team and their accolades. We had Kaylin Prince, all the we had Sophie. How do I say this? Sophie. Sophani. Sophani Michael, all league, and then all county third team. Gianna Delmedecker, Delmedecker, thank you, I my number here. All League, All County Second Team, Savannah Pes Pesmenti, I should get that right, just said it. All County First Team in all section, congratulations. And Jade Pesmina, okay, All League, All County First Team, and all section, congratulations. <laughs> say when you, when you talk about pride and, and what North Rockland's about, you know, the wins and the losses and all the, the, the all league and all the things that we do are so important and so special and it takes a lot of work and dedication. That's wonderful. But when I saw the North Rockland football team who came to Coach Lynch's services and sat there respectfully and were there as, as young men and we were proud of Mr. Zola and I were proud to say those are North Rockland athletes. Those are North Rockland student athletes. And I tell you, those are the times that make me awful proud to be here in North Rockland. So thank you guys for having me. <laughs> and I'm going to ask these guys to just introduce themselves before I announce the uh, accolades. I'm in full hands here. Easy for you. Christoph Lee. Jefferson Vargas. Sebastian Ferrar. Happy 
Yassir Javier Vescano, all league. Brian Hernandez, all league. Daniel Rivera, all league. Sebastian Ferrara, Ferrara all league. Greg Becker, all league. Montana Veep, all league. Lennon Fulgentio, I should, should know that one. I know, I should come off easier. Christoph Lee. Azu Frazier and Jefferson Barnes. Uh, Jefferson, all section. Azu, all section. And Dale Soli. Congratulations. <laughs> athletes in, uh, in the audience tonight that probably have some homework to do, so if you guys, uh, if you guys would like to, to cut out a little earlier, we certainly won't be offended to our student athletes and their families. Um, we'll take that at the moment to pause while they do that, and we have Mr. Levine uh, and Miss...
thanked our, you know, many recognitions of gratitude and, and thanks were, were given. I do not know if you recall, I originally didn't, original iteration, have a slide that I played without the audio last year. I figured I would save us all the time and not making that attempt yet again. Uh, but of course, I can make that video. Mr. Dennis Esteban uh, was kind enough to present a virtual uh, presentation to us about resilience, which I think still stands true today. So last year we had cited these next steps, and just as I was looking at this last year to see where we are now, I thought what stood out to me was the, the second point of continuing to look at additional opportunities and interventions for students who are not yet succeeding or, and or engaging academically. So of course that's a, a broad goal that we set, but I, I think we, here we are today, and I think uh, what myself and Mr. Morlino has been kind enough to join me in co-presenting, um, we're presenting a, an interesting addition that we would like to try here in further supporting and furthering one of these uh, goals that we had set forth last year. So now we are. My apologies. Thank you for the assist. So now we are here today in terms of talking about we've spoken in the past year how students have been connected to our field school community. Now we're looking at how we're furthering to support. So we have specifically something that goes as many acronyms. We have yet another one, TSP, Therapeutic Support Program, uh, which I will go ahead and introduce some of the, the highlights or facets of that program itself. Um, and then, of course, we will also then lend itself to the facility dog, which will become a component not only of the Therapeutic Support Program, but an available support to all of our students and to all of our staff at that as well. May ask first, what is the therapeutic support program? And I, I must say, I know she may not like the attention, but Ms. Taryn Soto has been a wonderful support of this initiative of just all the very descriptive language here is, is directly taken from um, a pamphlet that was put together. She was kind enough to join our, our faculty at the beginning of this year to just give a, an overview and revisit because, to be completely honest, last year was an anomaly for so many reasons in terms of what it looked like. So this program, I'm proud to say, has been in existence for um, a year and a half. What it looked like last year was different in where it was set, how it was set. Um, so we were able to reset it, and I have taken some aspects of, of the program as well. Flexibility, the highly structured environment, dialectical behavior therapy is a training that we have taken on as a district program, which I'm very proud to say. And, um, have in the recent weeks been able to see it in action with our students, um, with the members of the team that I'll list in the next slide. Again, when you see the extent to which the, the trained, certified staff that are required to make this run as smoothly and as, as effectively, um, it's, it's really something marvelous to see. And again, I, I cannot take credit to that. That is truly testament to the district, our special education department, and just partnering with us to have this available to our students. And as I mentioned prior, of course, if we have this in perspective, just for historical context, this has been in place for under two years. We've made some tremendous strides. It was last year as we had all different classrooms shifted and things were looking different. We also didn't have remote academy assistance, which thankfully we now do. Um, so now I believe that uh, TSP has found a home. You'll see some slides I won't say too much to. I will leave that to Mr. Morlino. Um, but really it's, it's found its home for the students and, and furthermore to really provide an environment that's conducive for them most importantly, but then to have um, an additional sport in uh, the facility dog as well. So again, I touched upon just some of the members of, of the staff were directly and of course there's many other layers are our counselors, um, my administrative team, again credit to Mr. Coffey and Mr. Garcia who are absolutely integral to, to everything that runs as successfully it does in the building. Um, but all these individuals are a significant part of, of this program as it exists. Um, when you think of school of this size and how many different layers, it's, um, these are all absolutely necessary individuals to make this work as, as a, I believe as successfully as it has. Um, and providing all these modifications and components as well. Um, and before I do pass it along to Mr. Morlino, so you do not have to hear me all evening, um, I would like to say just from a personal perspective, upon my first, I would say, two months or so, I have one or two personal connections to this program, as of many. One, I can say, one student in particular, I met at the very beginning of the 2020-2021 school year. Um, I found him in the hallway, seated, was refusing in one way or another to step into the general education center. I was able to, after some conversation, do so. Fast forward months later, little did I know that I would see the same student 
as I was going to observe Mr. Morlino formally. And may I just say, this student, I cannot capture in words just the confidence and the poise. Uh, we were targeting math, which was this student's kind of strong suit. And again, I think that was a testament to Mr. Morlino, making sure his students in that setting were successful, but also he felt successful. And I think as a result, he was able to move on, thankfully, and successfully to the high school. Um, there's so many other examples I could go on. Um, I will stop myself there. And I would like to introduce Mr. Michael Morlino, who will further expand upon first the therapeutic support program and then step into the facility dog and where it will uh, play a part of us. How you doing board? My name is Michael Morlino, I'm a teacher at the therapeutic support program. We just, as Ms. Sophie went over, um, the you know what we do, we're a highly specialized program. And being a highly specialized program, we have a highly specialized classroom. So in this whole image created a story behind it, and I'll get into that in a second, but this is in the back cottage. This is a double classroom to the left. You see, um, you know, the tables to the left. You see chairs in the back. You see a whiteboard. You see the computers to the right, and then, you know, and the, another smart board. We're thankful to get actually two of them. And um, there's different sections, as I said. So the first section would be to the left is more of the classroom academics, um, you know, different levels, so we have maybe math in front, and then in the back we might have, you know, science, social studies, and on the right side is where we do DBT skills. Um, we have groups once, twice a week. Uh, Mr. Vespo, who's a psychologist, sits there and goes over certain things, whatever they need to work on, social skills, what have you. And then in the front would be the same kind of thing, maybe decompression area. Maybe students have good behavior, anxious about something. So, you know, we keep them to the right, the right front. In the back, you see where that brown thing is, um, over there is the office. That's um, my office and Mr. Vespo's office. And in the back right, you see a little brown thing. Um, that's a dog cage, if anybody wants to you know, figure that out, because as much as we have to, we work and we rest and we eat, so is the dog. So if we work the dog for an hour, it has to rest an hour. It's separated, it's calm, everything's been thought out you know, as much as possible. It's a huge space. Outside, you can see in the back, um, Hunter was fantastic with this. It's, you know, all the grass, we were gonna walk the dog, potentially, we'll be in Mr. Rooney on Friday. On Friday, to go over all that fencing, um, you know, just to talk about this. This is actually a 3D model of the classroom, the different angles, and, you know, that's actually where the dog cage is. The funny story behind this is, I went to Mr. Guerrero and I said, I need, a student that's really good at this 3D model, because I'm not, I'm used to the 2D, and he says not the perfect person. So, um, Hunter designs this, I don't know who it was at the time, he comes in, he's measuring everything, he wants to get it exact. It was amazing to watch, actually, I was trying to figure out what he was doing at first, and I see Mr. Greer in the morning. He comes in the next day, he has this, and uh, I said, you know, I have to get him something, maybe a Dunkin' Donuts gift card, and whatever, so Mr. Greer says, sure, 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 I'll, I'll ask him. Mr. Gary finds me the next day and says, he doesn't want a gift card. He wants to donate the money to St. Jude's Hospital. So, <laughs> that speaks volumes to North Rockland in itself. Um, I can't tell you how amazing everybody's been from the board. Dr. Fosel, Mr. Zola, Mr. Levine, I can go on, Ms. Soto, Ms. Fister, I mean, Teresa Bondragina, she's over here showing me a shout out, but she's one of the key components to actually receiving a dog because it took us two years to find it, you know, a year and a half to find it. And all this, you know, all, 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 everything that comes with it was not easy. It was not easy for sure. Um, and, you know, I'm going to go over what exactly this dog does. And some people didn't believe me. On one of them, I'll show you the next slide. It's like you have to actually see it on YouTube. We're not going to torture you guys now with it. But you can look it up. So this dog is highly trained. When I mean highly trained, two years trained in everything imaginable. 40 different command designs, 40. You see dogs now, therapy dogs, and this dog is superior to all of those dogs. I, I consider it the Navy SEAL of dogs if you want to get into the military stuff. It is unbelievable to watch it. I had to go to Long Island, and they had to interview me for the process to see if we fit. They don't give you to schools often. They were impressed with everything we have, the space, the people, how we can help our students, and they granted it to us. So 
<clears throat> what does it do? It provides assistance. It has to be trained and tolerant in all environments. Um, it's definitely emotional comfort for sure. It's covered over all the ADA. And it's universal access regulated, which is very important under IDA for the 504 IEP. That's the most important part of it, honestly. This is the family in Medford, Long Island. Um, wonderful people, very open. Every time you email them, you email us back right away. Um, they made me train with the dog to see if I could handle it, and the dog was three months, and I couldn't tell you what this dog did. They had a dog coming with the for a year, um, and I'll go over what it did. It was playing like different kind of games, like board games with kids for OTPT. Um, it was just an amazing thing to watch. How can we support it? This is also crucial. So we have a, a variety of students with disabilities, and I want to also, the most important part is this isn't just for special services, this is for all students. I would say it's probably split, especially with the pandemic, you know, a lot of things have happened, so, you know, students need emotional support. We have everything from school phobic, social anxieties, PTSD, vertigo, safety and fire drills is huge because a lot of kids have sensory issues. And um, the dog will actually, you know, can you actually grab their arm and escort them out. Um, decompression walk, walks is also very important, and we're trying to, we're going to try to, hopefully, okay? you know, the board of Ms. Soto, Mr. Everybody, I should say. We're gonna try to work it into the OTPT thing. Um, you know, we also have, um, the biggest thing for the program is transition. So transitioning from outside of school to inside of school. Sometimes it can take a kid, a student, a minute. Sometimes it takes them 45. This is where the dog comes in. It'll literally walk outside, you know, get the kid going a little bit, escort them back inside. That's a big part of it, uh, school phobic students. And these are just some of the pictures of what it can do. There's a lot more. Um, we just wanted to make it nice and easy to see for everybody in the park and the public, of course. And opening doors, emotional support, physical therapy on the top right. is to just help students and staff. Um, we're hoping, you know, it's, it's going to be a wonderful experience for everybody and it's, you know, a big picture. We're hoping to expand this. That's, that's the point of this. A lot of people need emotional support, whether it's students or staff, and we're looking to, you know, bring it to other schools. Um, it's home will be here um, in Fieldstone during the school day. Again, my office is, is the point where it'll rest. And for some reason there, we have other offices and upstairs, and we have plenty of spaces for it. The typical day is the dog comes in um, with me, nice and early, get everything prepped, and transition kids into, into class, you know, have decompressions. If they have any type of behavior, anxiety, they, um, the dog will recognize it and act accordingly. This also encompasses like the whole program comes as a PBIS system, where it's a reward system. You know, if you do your work, you get X, Y, and Z. We're actually attempting to mainstream that across all of the school. Starting, we're going to start Willow Grove, and um, the other TSP teachers here—they go focus. Brittany Hart's here; she's been amazing too. I talked to her; she's probably too much. She probably has some time on, but that's how it is. We have to talk constantly and how we're going to make things better. We're going to start all of that very, very shortly.
complexities and legalities, but we work through that um, because we feel that it may serve our students and our staff the best way possible. So I was remiss in stating that at the beginning, so again, we appreciate that opportunity. Um, but from a logistical standpoint, where we know there were questions such as, you know, will this dog be wandering the hallways? Well, one, no, will not be wandering because it will be under the good care of its primary handler, Mr. Morlino. And as he did mention, we will have part of this program with, again, thanks to the partnership of Canine Companions. This is all facilitated and guided, you know, with their expertise. Um, that we will have a secondary and a tertiary uh, handler perhaps available to ensure that we always have someone that will not impact. I know there's questions of, will this impact instruction or how can we rely upon one staff member as, as much as um, Mr. Molino has taken the lead in many respects, you know, there are going to be many, many hands and handlers that will help make this uh, run smoothly. So um, we are going to make sure that it is balanced. It is not intrusive or disruptive in any way, but that if anything, that's why we call TSP as its home. Um, but of course, we're going to figure out the logistics of how we ensure our students throughout the entire building have the opportunity and access. Um, I've answered the second question I got ahead of myself. Who will be handling the, and, and Mr. Molino again, uh, I have found to be uh, very humble um, in terms of, he has not mentioned that part of this in the training and the interview process, which was a rigorous number of hours down to Long Island on top of this, he has accepted the responsibility as primary handler during the school day. This dog will then go home and reside with him. So um, when I think of what North Rockland represents, um, our staff, these are the people who are invested day and night. I mean, if this doesn't embody it, then I, I don't know what does. Um, how will the facility dog be available to the staff? I think I have answered that, but again, there are many layers of logistics. That's what we call this as a pilot. I think I'm being as uh, balanced and diplomatic as possible. I don't want to promise and say this will be in existence for, for years and generations. However, I'm optimistic that, again, if there were a place where this would and could be successful, I, I don't think to my third point on the next steps, it's not a question of if, as I was looking at my verbiage, it's a question of when this is successful. Um, it may take us a few months, it may take us a few years, but I, I believe that we will get there with, with every confidence. Um, so, next steps for us, which I, I just think uh, we, we do have, we're optimistic that canine companions will be able to give us the opportunity to allow Mr. Molina to go through the formal training um, in this coming spring. You know, our intent is to hope, just as we had stepped uh, in April, I believe, 19th it was, when we had welcomed back so many of our students last year, uh, I think that that would give us an opportunity to put a toe in the water, for lack of a better word, and just see how we can work the logistics, how students respond as we wrap up the school year, and then we can plan most effectively going forward into the next school year. Um, but again, I have put springs that we are flexible. We will make sure that we work with the dog, with, with whoever we need to. Um, and then going forward, as I said, when it is successful, uh, we will continue the use of the facility dog. And of course, many opportunities first at the building level to do so. Um, where this will lead, I think the possibilities are, are limitless um, in terms of could this be something for um, our neighboring schools across the street, our neighboring districts, or it, it really but my primary concern is making sure our students, our community, serve first, and then we'll see where it leads. Um, as we said, considering this is a district-wide support for Zine, and if all goes well, I would love to stand here before all of you once again um, with Mr. Morlino, perhaps a canine companion in tow, um, and then give you an update of that sort as well. Um, that is my hope. Um, I will also say from my own experience administratively and as an educator, um, I do have my own experiences I have Unfortunately, um, some of which have been dealing with students in, in tragic circumstances. Um, and I've seen many instances in which this has um, been a strategy, and whether it's a comfort dog that's been brought in for that student, for staff, for anyone. Um, what really resonated with me in this, and I was so very pleased that Mr. Morlino brought it to me probably within the first month or so of meeting him, um, he has truly had this vision, um, which I thank him and appreciate. Um, I only say that I, I see a need for this uh, in crisis, but I also see this, you never know when an individual may be in their own personal crisis, whether that be a student, whether that be a staff member. Um, and not that this is the solution, but it may be part of another layer that we can provide for anyone who may need it at any given time.
support of all of you as the Board of Education. Um, I respect and thank all the work and dedication you've given. Um, Dr. Felicello, Mr. Zolo, Ms. Soto, Mr. Rooney, um, our legal team, which we have been in con conference with um, extensively. Um, and truly, last but certainly not least, this could not be possible without the Field Hill Middle School community as a whole, staff, family, students. Um, and, and this is, as I said, uh, Mr. Morlino posed this as a possibility. Um, he has been utterly patient with me in perhaps slowing down and making sure we cross our T's and dot our I's, but um, now this is an exciting endeavor that we can all share together and um, do so carefully, successfully, and go forward. Um, I would be remiss as well. I would like to personally thank as well Ms. Dodrill and Ms. Riley. Uh, you will see many of the artistic elements of this slideshow work nowhere within my skill range. Um, that was a testament to them, and I will end with this slide. Miss Riley has uh, kindly given this as one of the many images, and who knows how that may evolve in the future, given where this goes. So um, again, keeping our students connected and supported is our goal, and we I look forward to serving the community to do so. So thank you very much. So uh, as we you know, continue through the board meetings leading up to our budget vote in May, you know that, that North Rockland has a tradition of um, you know, really being transparent with the entire process and making sure that uh, we involve the community every step of the way and make sure the board has all the information to make the decisions we do. I'm not sure we have the right slideshow up there. That's January 18th. While, while we're waiting for that to queue up, my, my first slide was uh, talking about the confusion that the court case in Long Island had regarding masks, and I want to just give a little update of where we stand and take you through the timeline of that. It's my first slide, but I can, I can certainly talk to it off the top of my head. Uh, last Monday evening, we had information, as, as many of you probably did, that there was a court case in Long Island that uh, said the governor did not have the right to have a mask mandate in uh, public places, including schools. Uh, and this was, was something we didn't see coming with, with this court case that night, and, and many of my colleagues and I and, and our cabinet were talking about, we talked with legal about what are the ramifications. Shortly thereafter, we got information from New York State Education Department, an official notice that said they're appealing this decision, they anticipate a stay, and uh, that this the mask mandate is still in effect, and that we are required in schools to still mandate masks. So, so we went to school as, as under our normal. We didn't change our COVID protocols on Tuesday. As the day progressed, there were some legal arguments and some folks that questioned whether or not the governor and the, the state uh, health department had the authority to have a stay, that, that they could actually have it be uh, you know, be, be upheld while this is heard in the court of law. So there's a lot of confusion around that. Were, were you able to do that? Was the governor and the state education department allowed to direct us to have to uh, mandate the masks? That evening, there was a court case to um, hear whether or not the stay was in fact legal. And that evening, that it's Tuesday evening, the, the stay was granted. Now, it didn't mean that it said that the governor could do it or could not do it. It basically said, while this is heard in court, you still have to follow the governor and the state education department's rules, but they have until Friday to, to submit their, their appeal process, and then we'll see where we end up. So uh, the stay was upheld, it was granted, and then we found out today that this stay is in effect until March 1st. 
Now that also brought up some confusion because the governor's original mandate carries us through to uh, February 21st. Uh, so, so those two dates really, uh, February 21st, if the governor wants to have the mandate remain in effect, would have to take action and say, yes, the mask mandate is in effect. Then it goes in effect until March 1st, at which time her stay runs out and it has to be determined by the courts whether or not that's legal. So we can speculate on, on whether or not um, you know, it's going to be mandated or for how long, but I, but I think it's become, become apparent that the mask mandate in schools and in, in public places is something that is, is going to be going away in the not too distant future of a requirement. And you know, in North Rockland, if it, if it does go away and that mandate is not there, um, you know, we, we will have optional masks and we'll follow a similar process that we did for our summer school programs when it became in local, within local control. And uh, what we did in, uh, in those uh, uh, the summer programs was we asked our students and our staff to respect one another, like many of us do now. And, and you know, it, it, it's, it, it's an inconvenience to wear the mask. We've learned a lot about it. We want to be safe. We want to make sure everyone feels safe. But again, it's about that comfort level and that respect. So if I'm, you know, if I'm walking into a room with Mr. Zolo and he has his mask and we're not able to distance, but I'm putting my mask on, whether it's required or not. And I think that's what we have to remind each other as things start to change with this pandemic, is respect other people's feelings. If someone feels that masks are the, the end all be all and they, they want to wear those masks, then that's, that's their prerogative to feel that and they can wear their mask and we respect that. If somebody is, 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 does not feel that masks are effective and they're, they're doing more harm than good for, for their child or for the other individuals that, um, that, that they're, they're dealing with, then we should respect that too. And it doesn't have to be an anger thing where we're pitting community against community. It, it's not an us or them. It's just, a, you know, it's just a different comfort level and it's, it's about respect as we have to do with many decisions. And unfortunately, you know, things have gotten polarized in, in, in our country, in our state, in our schools, and, and it's, it's become too much of that us and them. And I, and I just ask our community and all of us, regardless of what rules are changed or not changed, that we respect one another and that we are remaining, remain united and, and just, just be good people and good, good citizens and, and, and not be so angry at one another all the time. So, so that allows me to, uh, to skip my first slide, which talked about the mass. I'm just gonna grab my water here as we think we're ready to go and we're queued up. Mr. Seno, thank you for, I didn't see you move that quick in a while. You were up there quick, you got us all straightened out, so good job on that. Um, so as we develop our budget every year, our goal is to be thoughtful in the process, and our goal is to be student-centered. And all of those decisions that we make, we know we have really two things to keep in mind. What's in the best interest of our students, and how can we be fiscally responsible with the limited amount of resources that we have and the burden that we have to put on our taxpayers. So tonight we're gonna to go over a few things. Information that we got, and we have new information from the last time we presented on the budget. We had the initial governor's aid proposal, which um, is positive, and I have good news to share on that, at least the initial look at that. Have a go over our COVID federal funds update and the money that we received from COVID. Talk about some of our strategies for balancing the budget. Talk a little bit about the tax cap and, and the implications of that and what it looks like and how our Board of Ed has handled it in past years. Talk about some of our expenses and some of the information that we still have to gather. And then when we will be talking again about the budget. So, so this is um, probably our most important slide tonight and our most positive one is the initial uh, projected governor's aid proposal which shows, uh, you can see for our foundation aid. Remember, foundation aid is not like COVID money that we get in, or it's not like grant money that, that can change from year to year or go away. That's our, our basis, our bottom line. So if we get a percentage increase um, next year, it's based on, on this number and it builds from that. So it's, so it's reoccurring um, revenue source, basically. And a, a huge increase there, 28%, almost 15 million. And Basically, there was a court case many years ago where uh, when the state was in financial stress, 
they cut the money that was promised to districts. And foundation aid was based on a formula that the state said based on your poverty level in your school district, how much money you were gonna get. Well, several governors ago, that was cut, and districts weren't, some districts weren't allotted their entire amount of foundation aid that they were able to get. We've been fighting, I know our board has been fighting long before I was even in central office to get that foundation aid. I know our lawmakers, Senator Skoufis, Senator Zabrowski, our local officials, our PTA, a lot of folks have been advocating for North Rockland to be made whole in that. And this year with the governor's first glance at the proposal, they're going halfway there to make us whole, with the promise of making us completely whole next year. Now, as we know in Albany, this is not an approved budget, and next year certainly isn't approved, but it's definitely a step in the right direction, and it's cause for optimism as we look at an increase from year to year about the revenue source that we get from the state. And then these are some different revenue streams and breakdown of where it comes from and, and different levels of, of the aid that we receive. And then if you look at the bottom, you know, our net increase is about 15 million. Do you have any questions from the board on, on that? And then as you look on, on the bottom here, let's go back, this is some of the COVID money. And now the COVID money is a little different. It does come with some strings, and it's not reoccurring, and it has to be spent at a certain time. We have to spend it by September of 24. And a lot of people here in North Rockland have done a lot of work on figuring out the best way to spend that money. And also making adjustments because you know this this $30 million is given to us. We have to develop a budget. We were given a very short timeline. Ms. Lopez uh, did a lot of work on, on putting that together. But we know as we learn, we have to adjust and we want to maximize um, you know, the bang for our buck, so to speak. This was round two. So back in March, the first year, we got about a million and a half just for supplies and the masks and the wipes and the temperature scanners and all of those things. Then there was a second round, which was uh, the ESSER allocation, they called it, 7.2 million. And uh, you know this is money that, that we finally have received and it's, it's allowable funds for um, you know, addressing learning loss, getting our schools ready for COVID, again, continuing those supplies and materials. How do we address the social, emotional uh, needs that we have? Then you have the American Rescue Plan. So this was the third phase of money. We haven't, we don't have that in our coffers yet, but we know this is coming. And this has a few more strings tied to it, so you can see the breakdown of how how we have to utilize it. And um, a certain amount for for summer schools, certain amount for after before school programs, certain amount for learning loss. And, and you know there are, like I said, there are some strings, but we've been trying to be creative because. What we're really looking to balance is the fact of being able to keep our schools open, being able to keep our kids safe, being able to offer options for our families like the remote academy for families that see that as a better option. Having kids have the emotional supports that they need in schools as we transition back. Having quarantine teachers that are able to provide live instruction when kids are placed on quarantine. So all of those things of kind of keeping our district open but then all those other things like having a robust summer program, looking to give kids experiences like field trips that they haven't been able to have for a long time, um, having counseling services, expanding our, our course offerings at the high school. So really trying to make up for some of the, what the students have lost when they haven't been able to be here in person. But also we wanna, you know, and again, this goes away in September of 2024. 20, we wanna make sure that we have some benefits from this $30 million, which is a lot of money, that's lasting in the district throughout the year. So we're looking at things like outdoor spaces, outdoor learning spaces, um, our HVAC systems. What can we use some of this money for that's gonna have a long-lasting effect and a positive effect on our buildings, on our students, on the things that we do here. So, you know, it, it's that balancing act of how are we using this money to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to give kids what they need right now, but also taking some of that money to have some long-term benefits. And you know, balancing our budget is much like balancing our, our home budget. We have revenue is money in, we have expenses is, is the money that, that goes out. The biggest source of revenue for us is really twofold, is our tax levy and our state aid. We talked about the state aid in the previous slide, good news that that's going up. We've, for the past two years, 
Um, the first year, so in, in um, 2021, no increase in the tax levy. That was Ms. Eckert's last year superintendent. She felt that with um, everything that was going on in COVID, we were, the community was being hit financially and the community could not afford a tax uh, increase. Uh, board supported that and, and encouraged that. Last year when we developed the budget, my first year as superintendent, the board really um, was, was adamant in their, in their desire to make sure that we're controlling taxes in North Rock. And when we worked with our business office, we were able to come in and say, yes, we can, we can keep our taxes flat for a second consecutive year. And I don't, I don't know of any other Hudson Valley district that has not raised taxes in two years. After we had, had kind of had it set that we were gonna make sure we weren't raising taxes, we received some aid, and they call it bullet aid, so it's a one-shot deal, so you get it one year, it's not reoccurring. We got a million dollars in aid, and um, the board decided that we wanted to, to take that money and actually reduce taxes. So in essence, taxpayers are paying less today uh, overall. Now, now, individual homeowners, depending on different formulas and your assessment and such, you know, may have gone up or down a little bit, but ultimately we are asking for less money for our taxpayers this year than we did back in 1920. So that's something that we're all very proud of being able to do that. What we'd really like to do is to keep that trend going and see, you know, can we can we take the fact that, that we've got a, a big increase in state aid and make sh and pass that along to our taxpayers and keep that those taxes where they are and, and do our very best to make sure that our taxpayers aren't feeling the effects that all of us are feeling with inflation, with rising costs, with, with COVID, with all of all the different things that are going on. So that's one of our goals to, to really try to keep those taxes in check and see where we, where we land with that. Obviously, you know, we can't pr uh, promise right now that our taxes won't, be, won't go up again, but that's a goal of ours to see what we're doing. And we're gonna, we're gonna try our best to, to do that while still giving the students everything that they need in our, in our schools. Any questions? on the slide where we are here. Okay. So this just gives you a, just a brief description of the, the tax tax cap levy, and, and it's 2%. You've heard that 2% number, but it's really not 2%. Again, it's based on formulas and, and uh, different amounts, and in some years it's actually more than 2%, some years it's less, and what that tax cap levy cap means that's the amount that we are legally allowed to ask our taxpayers for when we pass the budget. So the last two years, we could have asked for you know two million dollars, two point three million dollars, the one year, and then um, you know three and change or, or a little below that the next year. Um, we decided not to do that. Uh, so that's the cap. It didn't affect us last year, but in previous years, if you look at it, um, you know we were allowed to not go up two percent, but 0.25. Then, then this year it was 1.3. Then one year we actually, we had to go down and we couldn't even ask for, for a raise there. There's different reasons and pilots and, and different, um, as I said before, formulas that go into that. But if you look at the history of, of where we've gone with the tax cap, the board has done a great job in controlling costs and our eight year average is below that 2%. So these are some of the things that, that we're starting to gather and, and work as we start to build that budget. What does that even look like this year? One of the things that, that you know, I've been cautioned by other superintendents, hey, you, don't, you want to take all of that tax cap, is what they're saying, because you can't get that back because that's where your starting point. Just like that state aid is your starting point, if you don't raise those taxes where you're able to that one year, you never get that back because in subsequent years, um, that, that what you raise is based on where you are today. So that, that was something that I was cautioned of by my colleagues, but again, we feel that our community has been hit um, for many, many years due to Moran, the largest tax surcharge in New York State, and seeing taxes increase. So that's something that's been one of our, our biggest goals. And this, this kind of outlines it well because it shows that cumulative piece of it. In 2021, uh, we could have raised taxes three point $5 million, we did not, so taxpayers saved $3.5 million. Last year, remember that 3.5 was not on the tax roll. We could have raised it 4.8 for a cumulative of 
before. So had the district taken the maximum amount the previous two years, the starting point would be eight and a half million dollars higher than it is right now. So that just kind of gives you an understanding of, of where we are with the cumulative savings and over the two year period, say about 12 million dollars. And then again, where do we end up here? Well, we have to run numbers, we have to get more information, we have to take a look at a lot of factors, but we're starting to build that. And again, wanting to do our best to keep this number at zero or as low as possible. Some of the things that, that are part of our goals this year as we develop the budget is to look at our facilities. And you know, things that we haven't been able to do for many years because of the debt, because of, of tightening our belt for so long, because of foundation aid not being met. Um, we've, Mr. Rooney and his buildings and ground team have done a great job at, at keeping things going, but, but there comes a time where you get to that point where, where fixes need to happen, or it's pay me now or pay me later. And, you know, this week we, we've had some, we had a heating issue at Stony Point, which luckily we were able to work through, but that's an old system. And, and we have talented, talented workers in our district that are able to keep us afloat. But eventually it's gonna to come to a time where those issues uh, need to be addressed and we need to address them sooner rather than later. Luckily last year, if you remember, Mr. Seno had proposed to the board and myself and we thought it was a brilliant idea you can carry over a certain amount of money in your year-to-year -year budgets. They call it fund balance. You can carry up to 4%. Um, you always want to budget for a worst-case scenario in certain areas, and, and oftentimes you have more than that. So we asked our voters to any money that is left over beyond that 4%, could that go into a fund automatically that will help us to do capital projects? We were able to do that, the voters approved it, and we're starting off that fund right now, it has $14.5 million that will allow us to, do, to address some of these concerns. The great piece about that, our building aid ratio is 80.3%. So to give that example of that $14 million, we can do $14 million worth of work without affecting taxes at all, have these improvements made in our building, and then get 80% 80, 80 of it back to the district and back to our taxpayers and back to the savings so that we can continue to do these things. What do we want to do? Well, we want to upgrade our heating and cooling systems in our older buildings. We know, you know, how, how hard it is to learn in Havistro Elementary School in June and in September and in those hot days. We want our kids to have, they've missed too much time. We want to make sure that they are in a comfortable environment throughout their schooling. So we want to get to a place where we're upgrading the heating and cooling systems in all of our buildings. Sustainability and making sure that we're environmentally conscious and looking for ways to, to, to not only save money in the long term, but also to be good earth citizens. Outdoor learning spaces, athletic facility upgrades, school safety upgrades, and, and general maintenance and repairs. So really what we're trying to put together now is how can we maximize, how can we take advantage of this increase in state funding, this increase in COVID monies, good budgeting that we've done, good decisions that we've made, and now give it back to our community and give our kids the things that they deserve. Which what we want for our kids is the best, whether it's the best auditorium, whether it's the best fields, whether it's the best schools, whether it's the best opportunities and field trips, that's what we're trying to do for our kids without raising taxes and trying to be as creative as we can to do that. Some of the things for our students, we've touched upon it already, and, and you've heard Mr. Levine and his team talk about some of the social emotional things, authentic learning experiences before and after school programs, summer offerings, different courses, different experiences for our kids, and really having them have memorable times, positive times, and academic times here in North Rockland. Still putting together some of the information and as we develop this budget and expenses that are beyond our control, Obviously, inflation, the COVID stuff, we don't know. Uh, you know what regulations we put forth to us or what the next variant we'll have in store, but we'll be ready. Um, any curricular adjustments or, or mandates that come up from the state, health insurance costs last year, we were lucky. We had first times in 15 years that I've been in North Rockland that our health insurance actually went down, um, but we anticipate a bump this year. Teacher retirement system costs, and employee retirement system costs. Uh, TRS is, is going up a little, ERS is going down a little. We think those will be a wash. We put this in here, the, the New York State regulations for transportation, because we have seen a steady increase in our transportation bill. 
because of private parochial um, routes that we have, to, we have to send out legally. What New York State says is if I send my child to school, a, a private or parochial school, and I live in your district, as long as that school is within 15 miles of where I live, then the district has to uh, transport you, transport your child. So with more and more families taking advantage of, of different um, learning opportunities, it has put pressure on our, our economic situation. The Morant debt, while we're in a great position and we're getting better and better there, don't, let's not forget that every year, $10 million of that budget development, the first $10 million goes to paying that debt back. So, you know, it took a lot of creative budgeting, it took a lot of, um, you know, different, different things and, and, and work from, from various groups, our bargaining units, um, you know, our, all of our, our staff members and, and really looking for ways that we could get, do more with less. And the building up keeping repairs, as, as I mentioned before. Good news with Iran, we're more than halfway there. Bad news is, yes, thank you, yes, we can clap. I, no, I, I felt the same way. I did. It was past the halfway point. We paid more. Um, and, uh, you know, bad news is we still have 170 and we're still paying, you know, over almost 11 million. But, uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're getting there and we see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and the days of us, you know, not being able to do the things that our community deserves are nearing an end, I hope, because uh, the light is there at the end of the tunnel. And we've, we've stuck together through all of this and, and, and we've kept this district a wonderful district and now we can even take it to that next level now. That's my hope. Some of the things that we've done, obviously, the transformation, uh, the, the closing of various buildings, reduction of staff through the years, our bargaining units working with us, selling of, of different buildings, energy performance grants, uh, refinancing, I know Mike is, is, you know, probably almost every week or, or every other week, him and Cleo Girandola and Rosira come to us and, and say, hey, if we do, you know, this, refinance this, and, or we buy our fuel ahead of time, we can save money, and they're always looking for ways to save us money. And, and ultimately, the whole reason that we save that money is because we want to give it back to our kids and we want them to go to the best district that they can possibly go to. No matter what our kids' interests are, whether it's sports, whether it's drama, whether it's music, whether it's the debate team, whether it's various academic opportunities, we want to have the best for our kids. And that's really my goal. I know it's the board's goal. I know it's the cabinet's goal. And I think working together, we can do that. I think we're in a position financially where it's realistic to start putting some of these things in place without raising your taxes. So more to come on this. Our next presentation will be February 15th. But before I wrap it up, any questions from the board? This is Gotti. Just wanted to add one thing. Um, probably since we closed the Neary School, can we get revenues for maybe eight or, two, eight or nine years on that every year? Absolutely, yeah, it's still, that's one of our revenue sources, is the renting out of that Neary building. What, what is that coming at, Mike, each year about? So about $1.6 million of revenue from renting out that to both of us, which, yeah, absolutely. Scott? Thank you. Um, on the very first, second slide with the um, state runs, Foundation aid has gone up 15 million. However, the BOCES aid has been cut 646,000, and the high cost excess aid was cut 803,000. Now, if I remember correctly, the high cost excess aid has to do with um, property values and the cost of living, I believe. And I, at one point, I know the numbers had been off, and we had caught up. But why has the BOCES aid gone down? So if, if you look back at our, at our presentations and our runs last year, the BOCES aid projection was very similar as where it is now. Because when it's budgeted, it's um, the guaranteed services that we get from BOCES. So a lot of our cross contracts, a lot of our work with the RIC, a lot of the, you know, a lot of times we, we take a look at where that budget is and we're looking for Mr. Mulpey. Um, you know, we'll, we, we'll do things like getting those Chromebooks, replacing the, the, the 
know, they're not smart boards anymore, they're BenQ boards, and they're the next round. So a lot of that isn't calculated into that because um, until it's, it's realized, um, it, it isn't calculated in that projection. So to answer your question, we anticipate that that will go up and be very similar to where it was um, in previous years. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Fosel, I'm glad you uh, mentioned the Moran on there because it's still here with us. We've been fortunate with the increase in foundation aid, it substantially has helped us immensely. But still this community sends out over $900,000 a month you know, just for Morocco. You know, so that's not money that's being used here, it's money that's leaving here for, for that debt settlement. And we're at the halfway point. In regards to the, um, the, the taxes, as you said, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a zero or a negative number on a person's tax bill because of the uh, equalization rate and of the different factors that factor in. That's a kind of sometimes starting point. The last two years has seen almost a 6% reduction where Haverstraw really hasn't seen as much, but it has nothing to do with the tax levy. It was zero and a negative 6.6. .6. And also, you know, often the people say the taxes go up every year, well, the tax levy hasn't gone up. And, uh, but on the people's tax bills in September, you also have the library tax, which is significant, and I believe on one time much more than the other. And that's, not, uh, that's part, not part of the school bill. And each town also charges a 1% fee for the, for, to process the taxes. So that's additional to that. So when someone sees that number in September, that's not all school tax. Right. So that's a bill that yeah. they previously yeah. had is just being built differently. Right. Yeah, right. And, and I don't blame no one for sitting there not analyzing. I, I too would just blame the school. But it's it's not uh, it's not all school. And I and I remember this, and I, and I appreciate you bringing that up. And I remember last year with the board, and we were talking about this, and they cautioned. They said, "Don't say that taxes are going down because we don't control individual taxes." We control the amount of taxes we ask for, for our entire community. We don't control those equalization rates. We don't control the assessments. We don't control what gradables come in and go out. So, so that's beyond the district's control. But what we do control is the entire amount of money that we ask for our entire uh, amount of taxpayers. And that's our goal to keep that you know, where it is and, and, and do our very best to, to keep that stagnant and not raise that. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Felsell. Do you have anything else, sir? No, I don't. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to item seven of our agenda. Any old businesses? Any old business? Item eight, correspondences. Uh, Ms. Piccarello, none? Okay. Item nine, did anyone sign up for public comment? Mr. Mopey, can you check the person? No, none? Okay. So we'll close out public comments, seeing none. Okay. Let's uh, move on to item uh, 10, action item. 1001, food service appreciation with February 7th through the 11th, 2022. Mrs. Zuckerberg. Whereas good nutrition is essential for the well-being of all and for children in particular, and whereas the district's food service department is committed to serving the children of North Rockland nutritionally balanced meals on each and every school day, and whereas the food service employees strive to prepare meals that appeal to the district's students as a hungry child cannot learn, and whereas February 7th through 11th, 2022, has been designated as School Food Service Employee Appreciation Week, and be it resolved that the Board of Education commence the North Rockland Food Service Department for their extraordinary efforts on behalf of North Rockland's children. Second by the board. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you to our food service workers for a great job. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, item 1002 National School Counseling Week. 
February 7th through 11th, 2022. Ms. Romano, please. Whereas school counselors are employed in public and private schools to help students reach their full potential, and whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents, as these traits relate to career awareness and development, and whereas school counselors support parents in furthering the educational, personal, and social growth of their children, and whereas school counselors work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential, their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, and whereas school counselors seek to identify and utilize community resources that can enhance and complement comprehensive school counseling programs and help students become productive, productive members of society, and whereas comprehensive development School counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Education of the North Rockland Central School District herewith extends its appreciation to all school counselors for their commitment and dedication to students and does hereby proclaim February 7th through the 11th, 2022, as National School Counseling Week. Second by the board. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We thank our school counselors for all the great work they do, especially for the lead these last couple of years. Thank you. on to a consent agenda. We have a lot of items on our consent agenda. I just want to let everyone know that the items posted here on the consent agenda are not things that just popped up on here. We just voted them. They are things that we've been privileged to sometimes two or three weeks, if not longer. Uh, if you go on to board docs, uh, there's uh, attached documentation on there. For example, we approve a bid and you were to go on to board docs and look at the minutes of this meeting, you would see what's even attached there right now. What, what that bid was for, who got the bid. So it's all, very detailed, so it's available on there. Use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate that item will be transferred to the regular agenda for consideration and a separate vote, thus preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issue. Does any board member wish to pull an item? Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? Mrs. Manini, second by Mr. Masiello. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion Aye. carries. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Krauss, thank you. Uh, motion carries, 7-0. Mr. Baird, can you discuss some of the personnel items? Uh, sure, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mopey, uh, I'm sorry, sir, if you could uh, grab, is Mr. Mopey still here? He's here. Yeah. Yeah, for, yeah. Okay, okay, Mr. Baird? Sure, uh, so I'd like to congratulate two instructional appointments tonight. I know that Ann Spat is here this evening. Ann will be uh, joining us as a teaching assistant at Fields Elementary School. She actually started on Friday, so welcome to North Rock, welcome to Fields Elementary School, Ann.
like to welcome uh, Ramona Pena Del Cerro, who will be joining us as a food service helper here at North Rockland High School. Yeah. I'd also like to congratulate Mary Ellen DeVito. Mary Ellen DeVito will be working closely with Mr. Seno in the uh, Assistant Superintendent for Business Office as our new Senior Purchasing Clerk. Congratulations, Mary Ellen. And then finally, and I believe Elvis is here uh, this evening, so I'd like to congratulate Elvis Pavone. Elvis has been working for us for many years, most recently as a grounds worker, and now be joining us on his new promotion as a maintenance mechanic. So congratulations to Elvis.